to hear. So as Nicole mentioned, uh, I work, work for an organization called the South Coast Conservation Program, and I'll talk a little bit about that more, but we really focus on things like endangered species, and a lot of people think that because we live in such a metropolitan region, that we have so many people here, that we couldn't possibly have a really high level of biodiversity. But we actually have a very large number of endangered species, and I'll show you some of the statistics for that in just a bit. And as the talk advertised, I'm going to do, be providing a little bit of a focus on a species group called water shrews. So I have some great videos from somebody who does research on water shrews, and uh, hopefully that will provide some interactive information. <laughs> so I'm going to talk about some of the issues. Why do we have endangered species in the first place in this region? and also take a look at some of the areas that will familiarize you with where the south coast is. We're kind of in the center of it right now, but it actually includes a lot of different areas across the lower main line of British Columbia. And we are going to focus on some of the endangered species themselves. So we're going to look specifically at a handful of species that the organization that I work with is focused on. And thanks very much to the Beatty Museum, we actually do have some specimens that we'll be able to look at after the talk. Uh, so you can guys can get a close-up view of what they look like, and you'll get a better understanding of some of the details in regards to characteristics, or some of the things that we look for to be able to tell them apart from other species they may look like. And then finally, what is an organization like ours, like the South Coast Conservation Program, doing to try to get some of these species away from being so imperiled in the Lower Mainland? There's a lot of things that we can end up doing collectively uh, as communities in the Lower Mainland, but the South Coast Conservation Program has some specific activities that we're involved with, and I'll talk a little bit about those. So when we talk about the South Coast, we're actually talking about a specific geographic area in Southwest British Columbia. It's fairly large. I often refer to it as being from desolation to hope. So if you're familiar with the geography of the mainland part of Southwest British Columbia, Desolation Sound, the Powell River Regional District, is sort of the northwest end of our region on the south coast. And then Hope Fraser Canyon is the east side of things, and we go all the way up to Pemberton. So that's a fairly large piece of landscape to be dealing with. Uh, we have five regional districts, 39 municipalities, and about 21 First Nations. So you can imagine if you're trying to work on conservation issues, a lot of different jurisdictions and a lot of different issues to deal with which can make it very challenging, but for our organization, we work collectively across those boundaries because we're focused on the endangered species themselves and uh, try to get away from some of the issues that are cropping up in regards to politics. Now, one of the big issues why we're having some of these challenges in the first place is that the majority of people who live on the south coast are squished into this valley area sandwiched between the ocean and the mountains. And if you've ever looked at a Google Earth image of your community or your neighborhood, you know that you have an idea where you fit on the map. But when you look at it from a much bigger picture, a lot of the population is centered in the Fraser Valley and in the Metro Vancouver area. And we have growth that's happening in other areas of the region, like the Squamish Lillooet District, which is sort of how Sound, Squamish area, and on the Sunshine Coast as well. So while most of the growths already happened in places like the city of Vancouver, we have a lot of growth pressure happening in places like the Fraser Valley where people are starting to move to because it's more affordable for housing. But a lot of those areas have what we call greenfield sites. So they're places where there's still a lot of biodiversity, there's still a lot of undeveloped green spaces, and that puts a lot of pressure on those areas. It shouldn't be any surprise that also happens to be where a lot of the hot spots are for a lot of endangered species that we have. You can try to find your house on here if you want, if you can see this. I do have some postcards that you can pick up um, that have this particular image on it. But one of the things that I wanted to point out when you look at this is you can really see where some of the green spots, the big ones, are remaining. So this is actually Delta Vancouver. This is a very special wetland called the Bog. It's the largest domed bog that we have in North America. Does anybody know what that might be called? It starts with the letter B. I heard it, shout it out. 
Burns fog. Okay, have you guys heard of Burns fog before? They're having the bog for the jog. It's either actually this weekend or next weekend. I'm not sure. So Burns bog is a very unique place, but what you can see is that it is surrounded by a sea of humanity. And so we have that same issue out in the lower Fraser Valley. This beautiful island of green is a very unique place called Sumas Mountain. It has some of the highest levels of endangered species occurring on it, but it's also surrounded by development and farmland. So as, you, as I said before, you can imagine there are a lot of challenges in trying to get various levels of government to think about conserving species in their backyard. And of course, population growth is going to continue to be a major stressor. Ideally, we want to see these numbers at the top go down, not go up. And that's really one of the main objectives for an organization like this. All right, so who might recognize where this picture is? I can tell you time-wise that it is not present day. And you might be able to get a clue because of the big tall ships that are at anchor in the water there. Anybody want to hazard a guess where this might be? It's in the late 1700s. Very close. So this is Vancouver Harbor. And if we fast forward to present day, you'll probably recognize it a lot more. So there's been a lot of significant changes on the landscape, even in a place like Vancouver. And of course, most people are familiar with Stanley Park. You're also familiar with areas like we are here. Pacific Spirit Park is, Park is another major green space in this area that is pretty significant for its biodiversity values. But we also have pressure happening on the North Shore, and you can see that there's kind of this line that's drawn in the upper levels where development isn't occurring past, but there's a lot of people squished into these areas. But even a place like Vancouver has certain levels of biodiversity, and the city of Vancouver is presently working on a biodiversity strategy to try to improve those concepts with local citizens in this area. If you want to look at it from certain types of ecosystems, this is mapping that was done around wetlands in the Fraser Valley. Now, historically, there were huge expanses of shallow wetlands that were part of the floodplain of the Fraser River. And mapping has been done to show how those have changed over time. So if you look at the teal-colored areas like this, that was extensive wetlands that were historically here in the 1800s. But if we fast forward to today, that's what's left. So we've statistically lost about 80 to 90 percent of most of the large wetlands just in the Fraser Valley. The majority of those have been converted into farmland because wetland soils also make fairly good farmland soils once they're drained. And I'm actually very sad when I look at some of the archive imagery from places like Abbotsford that talk about draining huge expanse of wetlands like Sumas Lake in the early 1900s with this notion that they are reclaiming it back for human use. And I often think that in our mind as a species, as human beings, we think about nature having taken something away for us, from us and we're actually reclaiming it back for our own uses. And that's kind of a very skewed way of looking at natural values. And hopefully we start thinking about nature as being a very valuable thing that we're part of, as opposed to something that we need to actually change into something that we want to use as human beings. And a little bit closer to home for me, I live in Coquitlam, and this is actually my neighborhood, the watershed that I live in, and we didn't really have a population boom until around the late 1950s and early 1960s. So this is actually an air photo image from the late 1940s. It still looks relatively good. There's a lot of forest cover. There's not a lot of roads. And you can see this big body of water here. That's actually a good indicator, so keep your eye on that body of water. Because if we fast forward to today, you can see that this is very typical of the type of development that's happened in North America in the post-war periods, 50s, 60s, and into the 70s. And of course, the Lower Mainland is no different from other major urban centers across Canada and the United States. The big problem is that when you develop like this, you actually start to fragment things and again, these are the types of threats that we're dealing with. This is why we have species that become endangered in the first place, uh, because we're actually starting to whittle down their habitat to these tiny little parcels and islands that make it very difficult for them to persist. 
but it also makes it very difficult for them to be able to get around and find each other. And a lot of the species that we're dealing with, as we'll see, are not ones that are highly mobile. They have very small home ranges. They don't move around a lot. And they're not getting out there the way, say, a bird can travel from one space to another. But I'm very pleased to say we actually still have some very unique species in my community. And a lot of work is now underway to try to protect those. But it's always about raising awareness, because the communities change over now very quickly. We have new residents coming in probably every 20 years or so. People don't stay in one place the way they used to, so that continuity, that, that thinking around conservation has to be renewed on a regular basis because of the way that the neighborhoods turn over. When we think about threats as a whole, we often think about the issue of climate change as being one of the most significant, if not the biggest threat to life on planet Earth right now. But there's a lot of issues in regards to which is worse, the loss of biodiversity, the loss of diversity of life on the planet, or climate change. And it's very important to note that they actually tie into one another. So when we think about biodiversity loss, that life, loss of diversity of life on the planet, the two biggest issues that we deal with are things like invasive species. So those are introduced plants and animals that we are moving around, either on purpose or by accident that have significant impacts on the native plants and animals in the areas where they become established. And people often forget that even things like domestic pets, like house cats and other things like dogs, have significant impacts on local plants and animals. Uh, it's a very contentious issue when you start talking about people's pets because they're very near and dear to your heart and you don't want to think about the fact that your cat may be actually taking a lot of wildlife out there because you often don't see that. Right? They don't often bring home their little gifts to you all the time. And dogs have a huge impact in regards to providing a lot of stress, even in local municipal parks if they're off leash and getting into the bush and things like that. Um, the other major thing that I talked about was this issue of fragmentation, of this concept of breaking apart the landscape because of human settlement. And roads are probably one of the greatest impacts that we as a species are putting upon our landscape. So roads break things apart. They also create very high zones of risk for a lot of wildlife because animals don't understand red lights. They don't understand intersection signs and things like that. They don't really have a concept about moving vehicles at high speed that they're dangerous things to want to avoid. And often we have a lot of species that get impacted because we build transportation routes right through their migration corridors or their breeding habitat and their instinct is to actually keep on going and moving across those areas and often they end up getting significantly impacted by uh, vehicle interactions. In regards to climate change, it may not seem like a lot when we talk about temperature change in British Columbia and more specifically on the south coast. The projections are around two to four degrees temperature change by the end of this particular century. But if you're a species like salmon, two to four degrees is huge amount of temperature change to have to deal with. Salmon are a cold water species. They don't have a lot of tolerance for major temperature changes. And there are a lot of other species that we're just starting to realize are starting to be affected by the existing temperature changes that we're dealing with now. Um, we've had a bit of a break in the weather in the last 24 hours, so today is very cool. So it's hard to think about the fact that this past week has been blistering hot, uh, because we forget about that very quickly as soon as the weather changes. But those temperature fluctuations, the fact that we've had these longer and drier summers that are happening, they all, have all, they all have impacts on species. And if those particular plants and animals are already stressed, if they're already in that red zone of becoming endangered, then these types of things actually have much higher impact on them because they're already in trouble in the first place. And they may not be as resilient or able to actually adapt to all of those changes that are being put upon them. So I promise you, I only have two slides with lots of text in them. But I often refer to this as the lists, bloody lists slide because when we talk about endangered species or species that are conservation concern, we actually have a whole range of ways of classifying them. And it can get very confusing. The people that I work with often refer to these lists interchangeably, but it's really important to note that only a few of these ways of classifying endangered species afford them actual legal protection for conservation. Some of them tell us that these species are definitely in trouble. So at the provincial level, we talk about red and blue lists. 
and those are species that we really want to focus on for conservation. But that doesn't necessarily mean that they are getting particular levels of protection either through regulations or legislation. It's when we move into certain types of acts, and I'll show you the next slide, I'll give you a breakdown specifically for the South Coast. When we start getting into things like the Species at Risk Act, which is probably the main form of legislation that my organization deals with in regards to protecting endangered species, that's where we really want to focus right now. Because unfortunately, British Columbia is pretty much one of the only provinces in Canada that doesn't have standalone legislation to protect endangered species. We almost got there in 2004 with changes to certain provincial legislation that we already have, but unfortunately the government has never acted upon it. And I'll show you some of those stats on the next slide. The one thing that I do want to point out is that we have this special level called COSAWIC, which is the Committee on, on um, I forgot what COSAWIC stands for. Actually, Nicole, do you remember what it stands for? I'm drawing a blank. The Committee on the Status of Endangered Wildlife in Canada. <laughs> Sorry, drew a blank there. Um, and we also have something called the Species at Risk Act. They are not interchangeable. So COSAWIC is the science body where people recommend, through evidence, what species need to be listed federally for legislative protection. But it's important to note that even though scientists may propose a range of species to be protected, they don't always make the list. So we don't have the same number being, being protected as are being proposed under the Species at Risk Act. The other thing that I wanted to point out at the bottom of that list where it says DD data deficient, that is a huge issue for us. When we're talking about conserving endangered species or even figuring out what species need to be protected and be protected in the first place, the big problem that we have is lack of knowledge, lack of understanding where these species actually occur. What do they really need in order to survive well? What do they need to be healthy? How much habitat do they need to you? How long do they even live? Those are things that we actually are lacking. They're gaps that we have in knowledge and they affect our ability to do conservation for a lot of these species. So as a scientist, for me, it's always a huge struggle to know that there's all these data deficient species out there and the resources are just not there to go out and try to map and explore and investigate every one of these species to make sure that we can protect it. So we kind of hope that by protecting at least a percentage of the species, that what we're protecting for them actually will help to protect some of the other species that we don't have a lot of information for. All right, so if we look at our region, just here for the south coast, we actually have about 98 red listed species. Now that XT extirpated, so we actually have three species which have completely disappeared from British Columbia, but they're still found in other places. And those are the Western Pond Turtle, the Gopher Snake, and the Puget Oregonian. Now how many people have heard of any of those particular species? Therein lies part of the problem. A lot of the species that I'm gonna be talking about are not very charismatic, they're not well known, they're often very small, and you may never see one in your lifetime. So the Western Pond Turtle, that will give you a clue. That's a turtle. It was one of only two freshwater native turtles that we have in British Columbia. We have one left, and it's endangered. The gopher snake was a snake that kind of overlapped with the South Okanagan area. It's still found in other areas. Uh, but the Puget Oregonian, it's a snail. And I'm going to talk a little bit about snails because they are one of those species that we often tend to ignore and people kind of vilify, they don't like them because they're small and slimy and they don't get around very much. You know, the whole idea that snails are pretty slow, well, they are pretty slow and they don't move around very much. And that's one of the reasons why people may not value them because of the fact that they're not a really appealing species. So again, you may never have heard of some of these, but we've already lost them in British Columbia. We do have what's interesting here in the province of BC, ecological communities at risk. So that's a little bit different than the federal legislation. Now, unfortunately, it doesn't mean that those places get protected, but they are very unique places because of the plant communities. They're often very rare spaces that are in existence, and they often will have plants that are endangered growing in them. So for us here on the South Coast, we're very interested in three specific ecological communities coastal sands, which are those wonderful sort of dune beaches, which we barely have any of them left. 
There's some remnants left in Ambleside and a little bit down at Jericho and Spanish Banks. Uh, but the majority of them that we have left actually in this region are on the Sunshine Coast and then up north in Savory Island, places like that. So we don't have a lot of beautiful white sand beaches left here anymore, but historically we actually had more than that. And of course, wetlands. It shouldn't be any surprise based on the slide that I showed you that wetlands are an endangered ecological community in the south coast. And again, many of the wetlands that we're dealing with are very small. They've often disappeared and been paved over very quickly without ever having been identified. And the problem is they have, they have a lot of very rare plant associations in them that never properly get inventory. So we are not even sure statistically what we've lost. It's easy to look at the big ones that have disappeared, but all those tiny ones under a hectare in size are little pocket wetlands that are you know, only there for about six months under the year. It's very difficult to actually have determined where they used to be. The last one, CEF, is coastal Douglas fir. And here on the south coast, we're actually at the southern end of the range for the coastal Douglas fir ecological community. Douglas fir is the dominant species. It tends to be a much drier community. And what's interesting, if you think about that image back on climate change, about how we're looking at, we're going to be looking at warmer temperatures here, we're not quite sure what's going to be happening with our existing forest communities. We have what's called coastal western hemlock here, which is kind of that rainforesty type that we experience, because it's typically been very wet in our history here. But things are drying out. And we're not quite sure whether or not coastal Douglas fir is actually going to expand its range as our forests start to change in conditions because of lack of precipitation. Now, remember I said that Kosawick and Sara are not necessarily the same things. So if you look halfway down that slide, we've got 69 species that are actually ranked by scientists as being considered threatened, endangered, and special concern just for this region. But the number of species that have actually been listed under the Species at Risk Act, especially the threatened and endangered ones, and those are the ones that get priority actions, there's only 59. And of that, we've only had action on 20 of them. So we're way, we're way behind. Species at Risk Act is 10 years old as of this year, and we've had recovery strategies for 20 species. And the most recent recovery strategies that came out were actually in February of 2014, that was four recovery strategies that were posted, mainly because the federal government was taken to court for inaction on its recovery responsibilities. So we don't want to be in a situation where we have to use litigation or court action to get the government to act responsibly around the Species at Risk Act. And of course, resources are the huge things. Recovery strategies take a long time to actually work on. They're all about the science, what those species need. They give us the roadmap. It's the action plan when we start doing things on the ground to protect species at risk. That's when the clock starts ticking. And we haven't even reached a point where we have a number of or action plans in place right now. Those are just a few of the species that we have on the right. Um, I've sort of ordered them based on endangered, threatened, and special concern. So the top one is one that we'll be focusing on in just a second, and that's the Pacific Water Shrew. The one in the middle, pretty cute looking little fishy there, that's a cultus pygmy sculpin. Has anybody been to cultus lake? No? All right, so the cultus pygmy sculpin is only found in cultus lake, and that's on the planet. It's the only place it's actually found is at cultus lake. And it was only discovered in this past century. Uh, people knew that there was these, this little fish there, but actually they didn't know that it wasn't found anywhere else on the planet. So that one is considered threatened, and there is a recovery strategy out for that, and they're already moving towards an action plan. But places like Cultus Lake are a high recreation zone, so that's a huge challenge, trying to protect one small fish in an area that is widely used for recreation uh, across the lower mainland. And of course, there's a lot of development pressures there. We'll focus in on that lovely pair of birds down at the bottom there, and I have some specimens to show you after the talk. Uh, that one is of special concern, and we actually just have the subspecies here on the coast, and I'll show you some information for that in just a sec. And that last one up there. So at the top, I mentioned that we have three species that are extirpated. They are no longer found in British Columbia, 
but they're found elsewhere, either in another province or elsewhere in North America. That one at the top, does anybody recognize who that may be? You want to take a guess? Spotted owl, correct. So unfortunately, spotted owls have had such significant decline in British Columbia. They are part of a range of spotted owl subspecies that are found all the way down to Mexico. But their numbers in British Columbia have declined so significantly that from a biological standpoint, we would consider it extirpated. There are just not enough left in British Columbia. I think it was down to eight birds that they actually had. And they've moved now to a captive breeding program in order to just keep that particular subspecies going in BC. We don't want to get to that point. There was lots of opportunity for action over the past 20 years that we knew that this species was declining. Um, but the actions just weren't taken. And a lot of times, it's political will. And that's one of the biggest challenges that we have. How do we get past that particular point that we have a collective action towards protecting these things and recognition of their value, um, that they really are important to us in British Columbia for a number of reasons. Not just because they're a beautiful bird to look at or a really cute species to look at, but because they actually provide value in many different all right, so the title of the talk was all about water shrews. And yes, we do have two species of shrew here that are called water shrews. One in particular, the one that I'll focus on a little bit, is a federally listed species. It is endangered in British Columbia. And it is only found in the southwest part of British Columbia, so only on the south coast. It has a range that extends down into Washington and Oregon. But as we'll note with a lot of species that are endangered or in trouble in British Columbia, they just have that little tiny portion of their range in southwest BC, and they have populations elsewhere. But the spotted owl is a good example of a species that, again, just had its range into British Columbia, but it's actually in decline across its complete range down to Mexico. And most of the other species that we're dealing with, including species like the water shrew, this particular one, the Pacific water shrew, is declining in other areas where it's found outside of Canada. So as its name would imply, it is a very aquatic type of small mammal. It does seem to be relatively cute, but you would be amazed at how many people think that it's vermin, or they confuse it with being a rat or a mouse. Um, I did an interview on the CDC earlier this month, and I gave the reporter one of our lovely little stuffed toy versions of it, uh, and he ended up actually talking to some kids with it, um, but they didn't find it very appealing. Now, I'm not sure exactly what he asked them, because I wasn't there. I kind of left after that particular segment. Um, but they said that they didn't like it, and they thought it looked like a rat and things like that. Um, so perception is everything in how we value a particular species. I mean, I look at those pictures and I think, that's a pretty cute little guy. Wouldn't mind having one of those, especially if it was running around in the stream near me. Um, we work with local First Nations uh, through Stolo and the Coast Salish area, and we actually have had a wonderful opportunity to do some fact sheets around uh, First Nations worldviews on endangered species. And one of the people that we work with is Carolyn Victor, and she's a phenomenal artist and illustrator, and she's done our storybooks for us as well. And one of the fact sheets that she developed was on the Pacific water shrew. I didn't even know that there's uh, traditions around Coast Salish interests in this particular species. So their actual stolo, or Coast Salish name, is Hihwahit, and there's a whole history around how people interacted with them traditionally. And that's one of Carrie Lynn's illustrations for us. And we'll look a little bit more closely, but one of the things that I want to point out is some very unique features on this shrew's feet, which are very specific and special to water shrews. I mentioned that it is an endangered species. The recovery strategy for the Pacific water shrew has actually just been proposed in 2014. And what that means is it goes out for public comment. And there's a window of opportunity for individuals, industry, and other interested sectors to actually provide comment on the recovery strategy for that species. Now, because BC doesn't have its own standalone legislation, that doesn't mean that they don't have a responsibility. 
Uh, so there is an agreement with the federal government. The provincial government does actually start the recovery strategies for a number of species. So the recovery strategy for the Pacific water shrew was developed by the provincial government two years ago. It then was forwarded to the federal government and it goes into that big machine in Ottawa and it gets reviewed by scientists there. And so the final version of it that gets proposed is now out there for public comment. So that's when we actually get to see a little more detailed science around it. So this is actually what's called critical habitat mapping. And critical habitat is the area that is essential for that species to survive. Now, one of the things that you'll note is you've got lots of little blobs all over the place. That's only based on the information we know where this particular species occurs. So this is information for where they found Pacific water shrews. And I believe we've only got about 32 occurrence sites for it. But that doesn't mean it's not elsewhere. And so that's always the big problem with doing this sort of mapping is, again, that data deficiency issue. It's only based on our best available knowledge about where we've actually confirmed the species to occur. And the hope is that through recovery actions, we can actually get more information where people might have cited it. Maybe, unfortunately, their cat has brought one in, and we can get a confirmed ID that it occurs in a local area. But one of the things we can do with critical habitat is we can say, this is what we know critical habitat looks like for this species, and we can actually provide it as a candidate or potential mapping so that we can get better coverage in an area and provide information for local decision makers like local governments about where they need to be concerned if there's a development occurring, because that species could actually be there. All right, so some quick shrew facts. And one of the things that I mentioned at the beginning is that we have two species of water shrew. So the Pacific water shrew is actually the one that's endangered and has a recovery strategy. The other one that's potentially what people may see more often is what's called the American water shrew. And this is a picture of the American water shrew here. And I want to point out some of these special features on this critter because it's going to be very important when you watch the videos that are coming up. So the American water shrew, Pacific water shrew are the two water shrews that we have. They're both very similar. I have a couple of specimens on the tray there, so we'll be able to look at them close up. They would be very hard to tell apart. And I can guarantee you, if you see somebody scurrying across a stream or diving in, you would be really hard pressed to even figure out, was that a water shrew that I saw? Because a lot of times we have other species like rats and mice that actually will take to water and they're very easy to confuse out there. And one of my roles is to actually take in information from the public about potential sightings. And uh, a lot of folks take the information in, but I always feel a bit guilty when I have to tell them that what they've seen isn't actually one of the endangered species, but maybe something that's more common. But we do get some interesting sightings in, which is fairly important because people are out there looking around. So the other thing I want to point out is that it's the water shrews are the largest shrews that we have. Um, when you take a look at the specimens, you know they're about the size of a, a mouse. Um, most other shrews are quite tiny. And they, I actually didn't know this particular statistic, but they are the world's smallest warm-blooded diving species. Now I knew how far they could swim underwater, and I knew how long. But I didn't realize that they had this wonderful sort of notoriety about being the smallest warm blooded diving species. So they can basically stay underwater for about 30 seconds and dive down below a meter, which is pretty good for a tiny little thing that's about the size of a mouse. And I also want to stress, it's interesting when I look at some of the media reports when particular species get coverage is how the science gets mixed up. So uh, this past month there was a report in 24 hours which is the usual magazine that you get when you're riding SkyTrain or on public transit. And the first thing that they listed was that the Pacific water shrew was a rodent. Well, Pacific water shrews and all shrews are not rodents. They're actually what we call insectivores. So they're a completely different group of animals. They're more placed closely related to moles, which are also insectivores. And moles are those guys that love to dig tunnels and make little mole mills in your lawns. I call it free aeration. So it's a bit public service for you. Uh, so they basically eat invertebrates for the most part. And because water shrews are aquatic, the invertebrates that they're mainly munching on are soft-bodied ones that they might find while they're rooting around underneath the water in the stream bed. 
and uh, they have some very unique evolutionary ways of finding their food, which we'll look at in just a sec. I also want to point out their snout is very important. They have this wonderful array of whiskers on their face. They're called the brace. Remember that? We'll come in just a sec. And their snouts are highly flexible, so they're quite long, but they've got this very unique nervous system for detecting scent inside of it. And uh, they can actually rotate their snout around, which is pretty good. Try to think about you being able to take your nose and twist it around without using your hand to do that. Now, shrews are hyperactive creatures. They have very short lifespans. They usually don't live for more than a year, and they're going all the time. Think about you condensing your lifespan down into a year. They have to eat every few hours or else because they actually will die if they don't get food every few hours. They just burn out. Uh, their hearts are going rapidly. Their temperatures are high. Um, they're just in an accelerated pace and they're condensing all of their life down into a very short period of time. The other thing that they can have problems with is hypothermia. So. If you're a shrew that has to eat all the time, and on top of that, you're an aquatic specialist spending time underwater, you have to have some pretty unique ways of keeping warm. All right, so shrews, especially water shrews, have these very, very unique feet, and we'll be able to take that. I have a magnifying glass that I'll be able to show you um, with the water shrew specimens that we have there. Uh, the videos that we're gonna see are by Ken Catania, and he's been doing some really unique research on water shrews, and he's still continuing to do it, and I'm very thankful that he's one of the, probably the only person that I know of who's actually been doing video imagery around them. So this is, this bottom black and white photo is one of Ken's photos, and this is actually a colleague of mine took this. Now, that's not life science. I just want to warn you. There was a B movie that came out, I think in the 60s, called Attack of the Giant Shrews, but they don't ever get that big, so you don't need to worry about something that basically has a foot bigger than an elephant coming down on you. Even historically, we didn't have giant prehistoric shoes. And the stiff hairs on the side of the feet are called fibrillae. So vibrace are the whiskers, fibrillae are the stiff hairs on the sides of the feet. And if you think back at the beginning, I don't know if you noticed, but I said one of the aliases for the water shrew is the Jesus shrew. Now, they've earned that name because those stiff hairs on the side of their feet, they're excellent for paddling, but they also help them trap water and use surface tension. So they can actually basically skate across the surface of the water for about three to five feet. And so if you think about a water spider, that bug that you see scooting around on the surface of the water, water shrews have that same capability for a very short period of time. So that's how they've actually earned that particular name. All right, so this is the first set of videos from Ken, and he started studying water shrews probably about four years ago. He wanted to figure out how they actually function underwater because they don't have very big eyes. So if you can't see, you can't really use your ears, you have to eat every three hours, and you're spending most of your time in the water, how are you finding your food? And he found some very remarkable things about them. So the first set of videos is going to actually be in, there's three segments. It's going to be in slow motion and then in real time. And remember I said these guys are very hyper? Well, this gives you an idea how fast they're moving all the time. And don't feel too bad for the guppy. It died in the name of research. <laughs> So what Ken was trying to figure out is how are they actually finding their prey underwater? And that's why I said things like those vibrisae, they come in very important. They become very important, and that's one of the things that Ken found out. <laughs> I should actually use the soundtrack from Jaws in this particular one. <laughs> And again, those hind feet are going, right? They're using those wonderful little fringe hair paddles. All right, so you have to get your food and you have to get it quickly because you have to eat all the time. 
The other thing that I wanted to point out, remember I was saying these animals spend a lot of time underwater, but they have to stay warm because they can suffer from hypothermia very easily, is the uh, bottom part of the coat is very shiny. You can see that it's very reflective. So they're trapping air underneath their coat. And that actually works as an insulating layer to keep them warm. It also helps with buoyancy a bit. Do you have a question? Um, I saw uh, um, for there was like, it looked like a shoe, but I saw in a video once that there was a type where they would like blow out like air. That's the next one. <laughs> 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 Did it look like that? Did it start like that? No, it like blow up this big bubble. Yeah, okay. So this is more recent research by Ken because he realized that they're picking up on those vibrations using their whiskers, that big array of vibrissae on their face and that wonderful flexible snout that's kind of rooting around underwater, usually in amongst the substrate at the bottom or in amongst uh, plant material. Um, but he also started to notice... and. If we were able to slow down that previous video even more, it's when I, after I saw this one that I started looking at the older one, I actually picked up on the fact of the, that the shrew was using smell. And that's the other thing that Ken found is that water shrews actually have this very unique capability to smell underwater. It does look a bit gross. That's the only thing that I'm going to mention. So he tried different enticements. This is wax. Is that what you saw? Something like that? Yeah, it was like that. You we want a bubble to be able right. to see it. So what the animal's actually doing is, and you can see, look at that wonderful snout. It's kind of like moving around. It's very soft. Um, I wouldn't try doing this at home. Um, you're probably just going to end up choking if you try to do this. Uh, it's actually sending a bubble of air out through each nostril. And then this is happening in a split second. You can barely see it. And you can also see the teeth in this shot as well. And then it's actually pulling those two bubbles back in to all of this array of olfactory nerves inside of its nostril, or sorry, inside of its snout. So it's actually smelling its food underwater by doing that. And that's one of the reasons why he figured, well, if it was just touch, then they would just bite into everything. So he had a whole bunch of different things there. If you notice, he had wax, he had silicon, even had a husk from an insect. But it was the fish that the shrew went after because the shrew could actually tell that this was going to be something that I wanted to eat, not just by touch, but also by picking up on the scent of that particular prey item. So this is all recent research, and this is phenomenal to know that this one small animal has all these wonderful adaptive features to living living and working sort of underneath the water. And of course, they do have to eat all the time, so it's very important to have these particular features to find their food. All right, so we actually have a huge array of other endangered species on the south coast, and I want to give them a little bit of credit as well. Some of them are going to be a lot more recognizable than, say, the Pacific water shrew. And some of them, as I mentioned before, are not going to be the most charismatic species, but it's important to be aware of them because they actually do play some vital roles in our ecosystems. Some of them are fairly cute. That wonderful little creature in the middle here is one of the ones that we've just written about in our recent newsletter. Uh, it's not a guinea pig. It's actually called a mountain beaver. It's the most primitive rodent that we actually have on the planet. Uh, it's not a beaver at all. It lives in higher elevation forests. It has to live near water. Its kidneys are incredibly primitive, and they can't actually um, concentrate urine. So the animal has to urinate constantly in order to get rid of toxins in its body, but then it has to drink all the time. It can become severely dehydrated in a very short period of time. So it eats very succulent vegetation, uh, and it lives near small streams and seeps. It lives near the type of habitat that we often lose due to development because these are tiny little headwater streams or swamps or spring-fed systems that are often not recognized as being areas that we would consider safe fish bearing. But they're very important to a species like mountain beaver. We also have an endangered oyster that's off of our coast here. It's actually the one native oyster that we have, which is the Olympic oyster. Most of the other oysters that you end up eating are actually ones that are introduced from Asia. 
So we have one native one that was actually over harvested in the last century so much that it almost disappeared and they're now looking at trying to recover it. Apparently, I've never had it, but apparently it tastes much better than some of the introduced farm oysters that we have. And we have some beautiful plants and fishes and of course this iconic species, which we'll take a look at in just a sec. All right, so snails, like why should we care about snails? Well, snails and slugs are one of the major ways of decomposing material in our environment. They actually provide a really significant service. They break down materials in the forest or in vegetative areas, and they provide that service for free. We actually do have an endangered snail on the south coast. It has a great affinity for a plant called stinging nettle. And has anybody experienced stinging nettle here? All right, so if you've experienced stinging nettle, you will not forget the experience. I get badly blistered. So you can imagine being scientists trying to actually look for this particular snail and having to you know, put on a whole Kevlar suit um, not to get too badly blistered up. So that's this guy up here, and it's called the Oregon forest snail. And again, like many of the species that we have here, it's just at its northern end of the range, its range in southwest BC. So it's found south of the border in Oregon and Washington. The other one that is up here, this beautiful reddish guy, is called the Pacific Sideband. It is not protected in British Columbia. Uh, the big problem is that, like the Oregon forest snail, we don't know a lot about its distribution. And there's this notion that people see a lot of them in certain areas and think, well, we just have a lot of them. So it doesn't need any conservation attention put on it. But the problem is that where people are seeing it are intact forest areas that are relatively undisturbed. Same way with the Oregon forest snail. So where those particular types of forests have disappeared, we don't have these species anymore. And that's part of the perception issue is when people see a lot of something in one place, they think there's a lot of it everywhere. And that's a big challenge for conservation because we know that based on our human land use on, the, on our landscape, that we're actually diminishing a lot of these areas where these species need to live. They are our two largest land snails. We call them terrestrial gastropods. And they're what are called pulmonate snails. So they're air breathers. They have a lung inside their body as opposed to, say, pond snails or the types of snails that you would put in your aquarium which still require a gill to actually take in oxygen. So this is one of the places where I recently found them in a farm in Abbotsford. It's one of the only areas on the Sumas drainage that still has a forest left on it. It's amazing when you look on aerial images like Google Earth, you can really see these areas stick out because the rest of the area is complete checkerboard or farmland and you've got this one patch of forest left in the middle of that. Uh, and this is a remnant population of both of these species living there, along with a rare plant community. So for size context, there's my car keys. Um, there is anecdotal stories that First Nations used to collect these as a protein source for food. And that may be one of the reasons why we found them in very odd areas, like up Vancouver Island, uh, because they may have been getting moved around as part of trade for protein sources. Uh, the terrestrial uh, invertebrate specialist for the province, uh, I just recently found out, she told me that her dad used to collect buckets of these things to eat. Um, and uh, it's pretty sad because people were harvesting them, um, even in recent times, not realizing that they were already starting to decline. So they are, at least for the Oregon forest snail, on the endangered list right now. The other thing that I wanted to point out is that there's often a lot of issues of mistaken identity, and that's a huge problem in conservation. Uh, people may mistake water shrews for mice or rats and consider them to be vermin and want to get rid of them. But the same thing happens for snails. If you've got snail and slug problems in your garden, and a lot of gardeners do, uh, they don't really appreciate having their flowers or their vegetables gnawed away at by uh, little slimy guys. But the big problem is that a lot of these snails look alike, and they look like some of the introduced ones. So there's actually three different species of snails here. But if you were to look at this picture, you might think, well, they're probably all related, or they're all the same species, except for maybe this guy, because he's quite different looking. But if you take a look at who they are, this is actually the same species of snail. So the brown-lipped snail 
or the grove snail is actually introduced into this area. It comes from Europe. And it's probably the most common snail that you will see in urban areas. When it rains, you'll see it on the sidewalk, more than likely. And it's the one that you'll find most often in your garden. This is the Pacific sideband. So this is a very young one, and you can see it hasn't really developed that sort of characteristic dark red flesh that it gets. It's quite bright pink when it's little. And this one up here is a lance tooth. There's a lot of different lance tooth species that we have and they're all carnivorous snails. So they spend their time hunting and eating other snails. They actually have a little bony protrusion inside of their mouth, and they're actually able to puncture the shells of other snails. Uh, they're looking to get calcium. All snails need to have calcium to build their shells. And remember I said that Oregon forest snails like stinging nettle? Well, stinging nettle is actually quite high in calcium, and we think that's one of the reasons why they're associated with stinging nettle quite a bit. Uh, maybe they've also figured out that nobody's going to try to get in and eat them if they hang around in patches of stinging nettle. So we do have a lot of different snail species, and they're often mistaken for some of the pest species, which makes it much more difficult to actually do conservation for them. The other problem we have is that people tend to think of snails as being something to get rid of. And if you ever go online and Google snail crushing, you would be amazed at what people are doing out there. The internet's a wonderful place, and it often gives you a good idea, unfortunately, of what human beings are up to. And I'm amazed at the amount of video footage that's out there of people actually crushing snails and slugs. Um, I couldn't do it myself. There are other ways of humanely dispatching pest species, especially snails and slugs, without actually going around and stepping on them. Did you have a question? Um, it's a you said they've got uh, what did you say? Like you I said, a bony protrusion. Yes. Yeah, so inside its its mouth. So snails have you know a very limited type of mouth part system. Um, they're they're scraping basically like a cat's tongue. That's what it would feel like if you ever had one kind of scraping on your hand. So with the lance tooth, there's actually a bony area inside the tongue, and they can use that to actually pierce the shell. So of other snails. You picked one up. Would you feel it? Uh, I have some urban myth stories from people who said that they felt one trying to puncture their hand. Um, I actually just handled some lance tooth snails a couple of weeks ago, and um, that didn't happen. So I don't know. But you can experiment. Get close to the snails in your neighborhood and see if <laughs> any one of them tries to take a bite out of you. All right, so we actually have a lot of rare plants. This is the phantom orchid or ghost orchid. Uh, it's a very enigmatic and beautiful orchid species. Like a lot of rare plants, it's symbiotic. So it actually has a relationship with other plants. It occurs in forested areas in the Chilliwack Valley. And it's one of those ones that disappears for a very long period of time. So a lot of our species are very cryptic, and that's one of the reasons why they become imperiled in the first place. This can disappear for 17 years before it reappears in an area. And of course, if you're in an area where there's a lot of growth pressure, you can end up developing on a site that had phantom market and never even know that it was there. Uh, they're often the target of collectors. Some of these rare plants are often in peril because people collect them for various reasons. I've been told it smells like vanilla. I have never had a chance to actually experience one in the wild, so to speak. Um, to get a good sniff of it. Um, so I'm hoping to actually get up close and personal with one of them at some point in time. All right, so the great blue heron, probably one of the most familiar species of all the ones that I've been talking about. Uh, there is a heronry here at the University of British Columbia, and it's not too far from this building where they're nesting actually in a stand of trees. It's surrounded by a lot of other buildings, which is kind of interesting. Uh, if you've been to Stanley Park, you may have experienced the heronry that's there. It's one of the largest ones that we have right now in the Lower Mainland. It's very noticeable because during nesting season, you will hear it and smell it before you actually see it. Uh, herons have very messy poop and they eat a lot of different things like fishes, depending on where their nesting areas are. So the poop can be pretty smelly and you can imagine a huge heronry with lots of chicks being fed. There's lots of droppings on the ground, and it has a very interesting aroma in that particular area. Has anybody been to the Heronry at Stanley Park? Okay, so it's near the tennis courts. 
near the park board office. Now, over time, herons do move their heronries around, often due to interactions from other species like bald eagles that prey on them. Uh, so you can get these super colonies forming, and then all of a sudden those are collapsed, and you'll get um, segments of the population that will go and start nesting colonies elsewhere. We're really not quite sure about the dynamics because we've only been studying it for probably about the last five to 10 years. I wanted to show this particular species because a lot of the um, public that I deal with often refer to great blue herons as cranes. So herons and cranes are not actually the same bird. They're in completely different groups. Uh, cranes are actually more related to vultures. And they only have this particular species here in BC, which is the sandhill crane. And I have a specimen of a heron and a specimen of a crane sitting on the trolley over there so you can get an idea. Now, I would say comparably that the crane chick is a lot cuter than maybe the heron chick. Um, the other thing is that cranes nest on the ground. They're very secretive birds. They try to nest uh, in areas that are surrounded by waters because their nests are actually quite vulnerable to predation. Uh, but they spend most of their time foraging on the ground as well. So they are quite different. And I just want to point out that they're not the same thing. So the next time you see somebody pointing at a great blue heron and they say, oh, look at the crane, you can actually tell them that is not a crane. Sandhill cranes are a completely different bird and they don't look anything like How are we doing for time? It's just 2 o'clock. So. It's 2 o'clock. Okay. So I'm just going to wrap up with a little bit of expose of some of our other species because we really haven't picked fix on some of the species that are maybe a little colder and maybe not as charismatic to you as some of the warm and fuzzy creatures. Uh, we have a couple of species of frogs that are of conservation concern to us. The northern red lake frog is a famous one because of its jumping capability and its cousin south in California was the one that Mark Twain wrote about uh, in one of his novels. And the Oregon spotted frog is probably the most imperiled species of frog that we have in British Columbia. Its critical habitat map has only three red blocks in the whole of BC in the southwest, and they're all in the Fraser Valley. Uh, it probably had a more extensive population historically, but it uses all of those big wetlands in the Fraser floodplain that have now disappeared. So we only have a few populations left, and they are doing head starting for that species, which means that they're breeding it in captivity, and then they're releasing the little froglets out into suitable habitat areas to try to bolster the population. If you were to see both of these, you probably would think they could be the same thing. Red leg frogs get their name because of this beautiful rosy color that they get, and you can just see it starting on this individual here. But Oregon spotted frogs also get a very brightly colored underbelly and legs. And the difference is that northern red lake frogs are actually terrestrial a lot more than they are aquatic. And the Oregon spotted frog is the complete opposite. So northern red lake frogs actually spend a lot of time uh, out in the forest. They need to have moist forest areas to spend most of their time in. And they go back to the water to breed. So you're more than likely going to see one in a forested area that has that population than you would an Oregon spotted frog that occurs in really large shallow wetlands and rarely ventures out onto land. Some of the other critters that you might be a little bit more familiar with are ones like the western toad. Now it's a special concern species for us. Again, we have a lot more extensive populations. One of the things that I end up doing is looking at historical accounts for a lot of different species. And places like the Bee Museum are very important because they have a lot of records uh, as to where things have actually occurred in the past. And there's a lot of places where western toads used to be and a lot less places where they actually are now. They need very intact ecosystems. They're probably one of the most far-ranging amphibians we have. Um, adult western toads can move about seven kilometers, um, which is a huge distance for an amphibian to be moving. And you can imagine, remember I talked about roads and their impacts. Um, Roads are probably one of the biggest issues we have right now because they're often being built through wetlands that these species need to migrate across for, for breeding but also for wintering times. And every year on Ryder Lake, we actually have a toad rescue going on because they haven't been able to figure out how to get tunnels in underneath the road to allow the toadlets to move back and forth. 
So people are going out day and night and collecting little baby toads by hand to try to move them safely across the road. This little guy up here, this is the Pacific tailed frog, and the males are the ones with the little tails. Now, they only live pretty much in fast flowing stream areas, so they're a little bit different than some of our other amphibian species because they're not in sort of still water environments. And they have very unique tadpoles that take about four years to change into frogs. The tadpoles have a suction cup type of mouth. Because they're in fast flowing water, they've got to hold on to the rocks during the time that they're growing up. And they graze off of those rocks and get algae. And the adults do move onto the land, but again, they're a very unique type of frog. They have to remain in moist areas all the time. This fellow down here, as you can see, I tried to use this image because it gives you a good idea as to size. So this is the largest salamander that we have. It is an endangered species. It's only found in the Chilliwack watershed in the Fraser Valley, and it's called a giant salamander. Um, there are salamanders in Asia that get to be about the size of a dog, uh, but ours don't get quite so big. Um, so about 20 centimeters, but big enough to swallow a mouse. So that's pretty big. Um, I've been told they make a bit of a barking noise if they get annoyed. Um, but again, I haven't had that corroborated. All right, so this fella's been in the news a little bit in the last week. This is the Western Painted Turtle. So if you remember from the beginning, I talked about the fact that we had two native freshwater turtle species in BC, and one of them is extirpated. So the pond turtle is gone, but we still have the Western Painted Turtle. The coastal population is endangered, and I'm hoping the recovery strategy is going to be coming out soon for that. We have all of these little sort of broken up populations all over the place, and unfortunately we have situations where you've maybe got one or two turtles left in a particular lake or wetland, and they're both the same sex, and they're getting old, and it's kind of like the Lonesome George story of the tortoise. Uh, so the provincial government and the Coastal Pain and Turtle Project are working quite hard to actually do head starting. So they're actually collecting eggs and then raising them and then releasing the little baby turtles uh, into more suitable areas. And also trying to make sure that the existing turtles that are left have a chance to breed as well. So the big thing about having species when they get to this point is that there's a lot of human intervention that needs to take place to sustain their populations. Now we've had two issues in the past week. Uh, one western painted turtle from Mundy Park in Coquitlam and the other one, which is from Burnaby Lake, were both brought into wildlife rescue because of hooking injuries. So both of them had actually ended up with a fish hook in their mouth. And I know from experience, um, I've seen turtles die from infections um, because they will go after a worm or a lure just the way a fish will in a water body where they're actually living in. And it's often something that fishermen don't think about, the fact that they're going to get an unintended target catch um, when they're out there fishing in an urban area. Again, very cute little babies. There's one of them basking under the sunlight. Turtles need to bask a lot. If you've ever had a pet reptile like a lizard, uh, you need to actually have full spectrum UV lights for them. Turtles are a good example of an animal that needs to absorb and produce a lot of calcium. So they need their sunshine vitamin just like we do, and they spend a lot of time basking on logs. So those types of habitats are very important for them, areas to haul out and bask on, so that they can actually produce vitamin D and ensure that they're getting enough calcium to keep their shells healthy. And not to ignore the fishes. So we actually have two species of endangered fishes in the Fraser Valley. These have been very contentious critters because they occur in farmland pretty much. And it's been a, battle, a bit of a battle working with farmers to try to get the streams that they live in adequately protected. And oftentimes there's a real big push to farm areas right up to the edge of the stream and not leave any stream site areas in natural vegetation um, because that's a loss to the farmer in regards to income if they're not farming that. So the one at the top is the Nooksack Dace, and the one at the bottom is the Salish Sucker. We've recently just discovered a population, or rather rediscovered a population we thought we'd lost in the little Campbell watershed in Surrey. Both of these species are very unique. They're actually remnant fishes, and they're what we call species of the Chehalis Refuge. 
So they actually were in these little refuge areas during the last glacial period where they managed to persist and after the glaciers receded, um, then these populations were left behind. So they're kind of artifacts from pre-glacial times. All right, so all of this has kind of been moving in a particular direction about getting involved on the conservation side of things. So my organization, the South Coast Conservation Program, is trying to be very proactive and being very strategic about where we put our effort. We're not a regulatory body, so we can't force people to do things. But we can, as a, a group that works to improve the science and the practices around conservation and work with the public and improve education and awareness around endangered species, try to create resources and work with the decision makers to improve the things that they're doing on the landscape. Because ideally, we want to make sure that these species don't continue to get listed and that the ones that are on lists come off of lists. Like the whole objective, the end game, is to work towards recovering a lot of these species, but also to make sure that the ones that are special concern, even the common ones that we take for granted, don't end up getting on a list in the first place or start declining even more. Uh, our population is growing, as I talked about at the beginning, and we're expected to double with close to 4 million people. Uh, within our lifetimes, 2036 is not that far away. We've got the pressures of climate change and all the other stresses that are happening in our environment. So you can probably recognize it's a very unique challenge trying to work in this area. So we're going to get people's behavior to change and that's often a very sticky thing. People are very set in their ways about a particular way of doing things, especially when it comes to where they want to live and how they actually want to change the landscape. And we're trying to find that important balance with a lot of the resources that we're developing and the people that we're working with. So I would urge you to take a look at our website and I'll give you the URL at the end. But the take home message is that we do have some very unique values in British Columbia. And just because we have a lot of people here and a lot of population centers and a lot of changes to our landscape over the last 200 years, that doesn't mean that we've lost things completely. So we have a lot to work towards. There's a lot of opportunities to improve things. And getting involved in the stewardship of endangered species is, is a very unique and challenging area, but it's also very rewarding. The winds are very important. And just getting people you know, to even get an understanding about some of the species that we're dealing with not to have fear around certain things and to learn to appreciate them. And I mean, that's a huge rewarding thing for the work that, that our organization does and for the work that I do. And I hope that you'll actually consider learning more about endangered species in your local area. It's not that pandas and tigers and polar bears are unimportant, um, but we have some very unique critters in our own backyard and I hope you'll take some time to learn to appreciate them. Okay, thank you.